if I can get my panelists to have a seat. Uh, typical mining conference planning, they gave me uh, five panelists and they gave me two seats. Ready, fire, aim. But I think we've accommodated everybody. You'll notice that they're all afraid of me thinking I'm going to bite. Um, we're going to do a few things today which I, I hope are amusing to you. The first of all is that uh, my job as a moderator is actually to moderate. So I get to have fun asking questions and I'm not going to answer any of them. Uh, the gentlemen that are with me have to give short answers. That includes you, Dev. Uh, we have four or five questions. We have four or five guys, all of whom are loquacious. And we're going to get through it so nobody gets to take anybody else's time. Um, that's it. It's going to be very interesting. Rather than me read can presentations that the conference made with regards to your panelists, uh, which I didn't bring with me anyway, I'm going to ask them individually to introduce themselves beginning on my immediate left and proceeding to my far left, noting once again in Canada everybody's to my left. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Miller with ALX Corporation. Uh, we have a booth over here, number 54. Somewhere. It's, it's in the middle down there. Uh, we're a, a junior explorer in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, name's Jordan Trimble, President CEO of Sky Harbor Resources. We're also exploration, early stage development in the basin, uh, discovery driven, and uh, prospect generator as a secondary strategy as well. My name is Dev Randhawa. Um, I help run a company called Fission Uranium. Uh, Daniel Major, CEO of Goviex Uranium. I'm the odd one out, which is why I don't get a piece of table. Um, I'm an Africa development stage project, uh, basically looking to finance with improving price uh, to build a mine. Uranium finds itself where it found itself in 1999 and 2000. That is to say, really in liquidation. Uh, International Energy Agency and Cameco both say that the incentive price to put new production in place is about $60 a pound, meaning that the total cost to produce uranium on a global basis is 60 bucks a pound. So we produce the stuff for 60 and we sell it for 23, losing $37 a pound and being miners trying to make it up on volume. The question I have goes like this. You resolve a commodities bear market one of two ways. One is demand creation, which is a consequence of the fact that the low price of the commodity generates so much utility for consumers that they increase consumption and raise the price. The second way that you resolve commodities bear markets are through exterior, extended periods of liquidation where you destroy the productive capacity of the industry and you match supply and demand through supply destruction rather than demand creation. Gentlemen, quick answers. Looking forward to the next two or three years, do we A, go out of business? No more uranium and the lights don't go on. I'm giving you the answer. B, do we generate so much utility for our consumers that the price of uranium goes up because the stuff is just too cheap? Or C, do we restore the balance between supply and demand through the consequence of demand creation? I guess I'm up first. Uh, you know, I've worked in uranium for 40 years, uh, production, exploration, and yeah, we've seen this cycle before. Uh, we saw it 10 years ago, back to 2004. It was extremely strong then. I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to go back to that. But yes, I see uh, option C here is, uh, is there will be more discoveries made. Uh, the reason ALX is in the Athabasca Basin is because that's the highest grade, cheapest to mine deposits in the world. Uh, the lower grade deposits around the world, uh, I don't think will be uh, that competitive going forward. Um, yeah, I think, I think the supply side is what's really interesting with uranium. I mean, we know the demand side, uh, 59 reactors under construction, many hundreds more proposed, planned, ordered. Uh, more nuclear energy came on the grid last year than any year in the last, over the last 40 years. So, the, 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 you know, the demand side we know is, is going to be pretty steady. Supply side is interesting. Supply has worked against us, uh, hence we're trading at a $20 uranium price. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize there's, there's not one mine right now that actually makes money at $20 a pound. Uh, and when we talk about this $60 price to incentivize new production to come online, I mean, that's triple the price. That's triple where we are right now. So I think uh, if you look globally right now, th there's really not a whole lot of significant supply 
new mines uh, coming online in the next five to ten years. Uh, so I think the supply side is going to be the driver going forward. Well, I'm going to embarrass myself and say that I'm going to plagiarize right out the chute. You're going to train or you're a victim. I heard that from somebody here. And, uh, and I'll plagiarize uh, Tim Getzel. These prices are irrational and sustainable. Fukushima didn't drop the demand for uranium. It changed the way the buying cycle. So what we have today is people playing with the spot price in a way, another agenda. So to me, when you see 50,000 pounds of uranium determining a $150 million market, something is wrong. So it's the most easiest contrarian play out there. Um, what our partners are in China, and we hear their story. The bottom line is, before, utilities used to buy uranium five, 10 years in advance. Now, it's two to three years in advance. So they're not, therefore, there aren't any buyers right now. I do believe that psychologically, Japan is the, the key um, in terms of elephants, but the big elephant will be China in our view of what they're doing. They see it as real. But, you know, to as investors, and the nice thing is for you guys, there's not a lot of great names out there. And so that if you can survive this uh, market we're in, pick a number of names. And a lot of them are at this table. So, you know, be a contrarian or a victim. But the, there's no way this market can stay the way it is. And there's more demand now than since Fukushima. The difference is the buying cycle of utilities. Uh, very much a supply side argument here. Uh, demand is well covered. You're looking at going from 180 million pounds to 240 million pounds over the next 25 years. In the next 10 years, you're going to see 20% of world production close. Why? Because these are old mines that are coming to their end. You cannot incentivize that price. You are looking at short-term, long-term contracts unwinding very quickly. That is important because if you're making money on your contract, you'll stay in business. As soon as you've got to make that contract decision, you have to make a production decision. We saw that already this year with Cameco when their TEPCO contract was canceled. The first thing they did was take production out of the market to push it down. If Cameco, for example, is to have contracts canceled and they push down the, pr the production, that gives you the production squeeze. There is no spot market. We're seeing utilities around the market looking to find out where they're going to get production from. The big tier one utilities we're talking to, because we're at that development stage, saying they're comfy today, they have contract, they have inventory, they're very nervous three years from now, and five years from now, they are very, very nervous about where their supply will come from. Are there technological changes afoot in production, in processing, in exploration, that could drive down the cost of producing uranium, or, or, that could either simultaneously or not make individual companies more attractive. Uh, what about the future of technology in the uranium business? And I'll start this time with you, Dan. <laughs> One of the reasons that we've been able to be successful on our development of our projects is we've not been scared of new technology. Um, so we have been working on a, uh, upgrading our material before we actually apply any consumables to it. So we're to a point where we get about 95% of our uranium is in 20% of the material that actually ends up in the consumable part. Uh, in addition to that, we found ways of separating molybdenum and uranium, so we turned a negative into a positive, where molybdenum is now 10% of our byproduct revenue rather than the other. So I, there are small changes. I think negative prices make us all think harder. We can continue to squeeze. Have we seen anything as fundamental as heat leaching from sulfides? No, we haven't seen the game changer in our industry. What we are seeing is we're all having to work a lot harder to make our projects better incentive price, and that's really our push. Well, there is no fission uranium if our technical team, by, led by Ross, doesn't believe in how do we beat the big boys. We took an airplane that no one had taken before, low to the ground, and copied what uh, Stu Blossom and some of the guys did in Diamonds took an airplane really low and we're looking for outcrops of uranium and or something or, or boulders in our case we found boulders and if it wasn't for you know as young companies if you're not doing anything different than anybody else you're not get the same result so without trying different things that's the only way we can get ahead and that's how you know the, the PLS deposit was discovered you got 
you've got to go against the grain. Everybody told us, you've got to go in the east. You've got to go in the east. That's what everything is. We didn't. We went to the west. And we're not actually in the basin. Because everybody said all the uranium is in the basin. But what with the basin was, uh, you know, 100 million years ago was not the basin. So I think that's the only way junior companies can um, beat the big boys, is that we have to think differently. And I'm thankful that we had some people that were smart and thought outside the box. So we wouldn't be even be here if it wasn't for us trying some different things. Yeah, just to echo what Dev said, in particular in the basin, uh, there's been a lot of innovation and kind of new thinking with the exploration, uh, and hence you've had these spectacular discoveries, fission, next gen, um, you know, even the Griffin deposit, Denison's Griffin deposit. So new, more refined geophysical techniques is one, directional drilling, these are, you know, you're, you're finding a needle in a haystack, so you want to, you know, as I say, return on drilling, you want to make sure that that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar $70,000 drill hole gets you some uranium. Um, another big thing too is, as Dev talked about, is the, the thinking in the basin, it used to just be very very myopic. You were looking for sandstone hosted uh, unconformity deposits uh, and uh, look at the recent discoveries. They've all been in the basement rock, right? Uh, the feeder zone. So, uh, you know, that's that's important. Um, so as an exploration company, that's that's something we're looking at. Uh, we're implementing. We want to be ahead of the curve. And, uh, you know, necessity breeds innovation. That's what we've seen in the basin. That's what we've seen uh, in a depressed uranium market. On, on a, on a um, development and production uh, side of things. Uh, our flagship project on the east side of the basin is called Moore Lake. And uh, what, what we're finding there is, is shallow high-grade mineralization. It is unconformity hosted. We're, we're looking to test the basement rock as well. There's a new technology, extraction technology, being developed by two of our partners. One of is our largest shareholder, Denison Mines, uh, and another company called Arriva, industry leader out of France. It's called Saber, and what it is is surface access borehole resource extraction, bit of a mouthful, but uh, you're basically drilling a borehole down to and jet boring uh, high grade uranium into a, a high grade uranium slurry and pumping it up to surface. Uh, it's quite interesting and they're, they're trying to commercialize it right now. They're working at it at, at McLean Lake, but uh, it works down to about 300 meters and, and our project uh, could be a potential fit for that. You bring your mining costs way down uh, and you basically ship it up to McLean Lake, which has excess capacity. I spent uh, 20 years with uh, Arriva, and uh, I remember when Cigar Lake, uh, the, the single highest grade deposit in the world, was discovered back in the early 80s. It was, uh, it was a game changer then. And, uh, you know, it's just now been in production the last few years, so it's, it's taken, taken a long time. But, you know, the uh, Athabasca is a great place to be. Uh, you have to find a Cigar Lake every three years right now to meet the worldwide demand for uranium. I think that's actually possible. I think the basin and the, and the immediate surrounding areas, that's the best area to be in the world. And there's, there's a couple of things you have to have if you're in this junior market. You have to have the people, people that know what they're doing, have a proven track record. You also have the uh, integrity. You have to be honest with your shareholders and honest with anyone uh, putting up the dollars uh, with your group. There's one other component though, Rick, it's politics. Uh, you know, Saskatchewan used to be kind of a tough a province to work in. Now I believe it's ranked number one by the Fraser Institute here in Vancouver. So that's why we're there. Uh, I've looked for uranium on almost every continent but Antarctica. And uh, the place I want to be is the Athabasca Basin. For me to ask, you know, um, at the beginning of the last bull market cycle in uranium, 1998, 1999, 2000, I think there were five uranium juniors in the world. And not being able to choose amongst them, I bought as much as I could afford of all five. Um, a little confession here. I was rewarded for my genius by seeing them all fall in price by 50% fairly immediately, which was actually OK. Um, you test your thesis, that's OK. Because the worst of them in the next six years, the worst of them went up 22 to 1. And I remember very well at the bottom of the cycle, people were of two minds of uranium. They either were bored of it because they hadn't had a bull market in it for 20 years, or they hated it as a consequence of Nagasaki, Hiroshima, or Three Mile Island. I'd be on the podium and I'd be talking about uranium and I'd get off and people would say, you unconscionable son of a bitch. I can't, I mean, you're just a despicable human being. True. 
Four years later, when the uranium price had gone from 10 bucks a pound to 130 bucks a pound, and the worst company in the industry was up 22 to 1, the same people who were questioning my ethics and morals were asking me for stock picks, which I found to be hugely amusing. And the most interesting part from my point of view of that is that at the beginning of the exercise, there were five juniors looking for uranium. At the end of the exercise, there were 500 juniors looking for uranium. Now, what was interesting about that, and I will get to a question, believe me. What was interesting about that is that at the beginning of the exercise, there may have been 12 or 15 teams worldwide that were competent to look for uranium. So the probability that you had a competent team in a junior was taking the number of starts, five, and looking at the number of competent teams, 15. At the top, those are pretty good odds, right? I mean, the chances, assuming that the investors behind them are competent, the chances are 100%. At the top of the cycle, the number of teams hadn't changed. It was 15. Maybe you'd shaken a few out of Cameco, so maybe there was 17 or 18. But the number of starts was 500. So the chance that your uranium junior was run by a competent team at the top of the sector when everybody wanted to be in uranium was simply a function of dividing the number of available teams, 15 to 20, by 500, the number of the companies. It's odd how people react. So putting you all on the spot now, I don't know how many starts there are in the world now, maybe 30? I mean, how many juniors? Uh, uh, will still admit to being in the uranium business. They're not looking for uranium as an indicator for lithium or cobalt or something. Um, tell me why I can believe that your company has a credible team. In other words, tell me why your intellectual capital makes you deserve to be here. Well, well thanks, Rick. Uh, you know, the, the ALX team uh, has been around a long time. Some of them go back further than I, I do. Uh, in the uranium sector, which goes back 41 years for me, but they were with all the big boys. Uh, Saskatchewan Development Corporation, which was spun into Cameco years ago. Myself came through a company called Utah International, Pathfinder, General Electric, and then we were taken over by Areva. Uh, you know, the, the Utah uh, GE connection was the largest corporate merger in history based on uranium assets in the U.S. Uh, you know, again, you just, you know, I've I've forgotten more than, than a lot of people that are in uranium now, uh, you know, talk about it. So, you know, it's we're not, not trying really to make me. senility like a, <laughs> senility a good thing, uh, are we? That's probably part of it too, Rick, but I, I, I've known you in uranium for 20 plus years now, so. <laughs> Sad but true. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the other team members have the same type of experience. Uh, they've stayed in the basin, they have successful track records in the basin, they have their, uh, their fingerprints on a, on a lot of things, and it's not always, it's, in fact, I know very few examples of exploration, whether it's uranium or something else, around the world where it's one individual that made it difference. It's a team effort and the team has to work together to make the things happen. And uh, that's what I see in ALX. Uh, some of my former team members that, uh, that I had in previous companies are, are in the group and we're working hard to uh, you know, go through the properties we have. You know, frankly, our, our cash or cash equivalents now is greater than our market cap. It's a great entry point for us, uh, for you, uh, to get into that particular type of situation. But, uh, you know, we're going to rotate through properties, we're going to drop ones that we don't like the results, and we're going to pick up others where we think we have a fresh idea. And it's all about ideas. You know, sitting around and, and, and not coming up with new ideas, uh, that's a death knell. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people is arguably the most important ingredient for success with these companies. And uh, we, you know, one of the things, uh, we started Sky Harbor about four years ago. Uh, my chairman, Jim Pettit, and I, we, we built and sold a gold company, sold that to New Gold, and, and um, you know, really did see an opportunity uh, in the basin in uranium, uh, and went out and started building uh, a team that we thought had the best focused expertise. It's important, you know, it's one thing to have lots of years of experience and, and, and knowledge. It's another thing, you want to make sure it's focused expertise, right? What, do, what are we doing? We're going out there, we're looking for high-grade uranium in the basin. We're exploring for high-grade uranium in the basin. It, it probably doesn't serve us well to have a mining engineer that knows ISR deposits in the U.S. That We need to find guys that know uh, how to find high-grade in the basin. So we started uh, a gentleman named 
Rick Kazmersky, and, and uh, his nickname coined by Lucas Lundin is Radioactive Rick. Well-deserved well name. He's found a lot of uranium. He was a 40-year veteran in the, in the basin. Uh, he was with Cameco for a, a number of years. He was actually the exploration manager there. Started a company uh, in 1999 called JNR. Uh, took it from a $5 million market cap to over 400 in 2007. Subsequently sold it to Dennis in mind. So uh, Rick and his team in Saskatoon, Dave Billard, Christine McKechnie, who actually wrote her thesis at University of Saskatchewan on one of our projects, a very strong geological team with focused expertise in the basin. Dave Cates, the president and CEO of Denison Mines, our largest shareholder, strategic shareholder. Uh, Dave is uh, on our board. We have a, a strategic partnership with them, very close working relationship. And last but not least, Paul Matizic, well-known name in the industry. He's built and sold four companies in the last 12 years, notably Energy Metals Corp, uranium company, uh, started at $10 million value valuation, sold it to Uranium One for $1.8 billion. And we have a good mix. We have, a, you know, the, the passion, the youth, um, and we also have uh, many, many years of experience with, uh, with Rick and Paul and, and uh, Dave Cates as well. I buy beer. I think that's what Rick used to say, what promoters do, figure out who buys the beer. Um, my other job is to find people a lot smarter than me. And um, that wasn't always, that's not that hard technically. And um, we've been very fortunate, even in this crappy market, Fission is our third company of the original set of shares I started in a basement suite. We're at 350 million. There's not an award our team hasn't won. Mining Person of Canada, Ernst Young Entrepreneur of the Year, blah, 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 blah. But you know what, it doesn't really matter, my track record, is how my shareholders done with me. Have you made money with me? If you own the original shares that you bought with me in Strathmore when I started out at 10, 8 cents, today you own shares in your portfolio of four companies. It doesn't matter my track record. Did you make money with me? And I'm proud to say that's what we've done for our people. We also, over our career, brought in Sumitomo into a project, Korean Electric Power into one project, now CGN. You know, we've prided ourselves on caring for our shareholders. When shareholders and management align, that's when magic can happen. But you have the right people. And I'm proud that I buy beer for the very best people in the world. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, um, we're in a very different position. I'm just going to go back to the monologue to start with. I think the one point I have to make is in that bull cycle as it turned, two shares outperformed every other share by a very large margin. The two shares were energy fuels and paladin resources. The difference between those two and everybody else is they built mines. Um, if you wanted to track all the developers and the producers, they actually all followed each other and you could have just bought Cameco. Um, we are a developer. That is what we are doing. We are out to build mines. Um, we're already working on the debt side. The debt team we've got working on our project happens to be the only debt team in the private market that in the last cycle financed projects. Two of those projects were taken out at over a billion dollars because that's when the big producers come in to take out your projects. Both of those in Africa. My back track record, I've worked in multiple projects. I've worked on multiple projects, bringing them in well under budget. I've worked in Africa, I've worked in Russia, I've worked in South America and Canada in multiple commodities. I've got a strong technical team on our side. We have Cameco, we have Toshiba and Denison as major shareholders. One of our major directors, other than David Cates, I'd po point out, because we are in West Africa, is Ben Wallace-Sal, the find founder of Semifo. So we obviously have to deal with political risk, and he's a key guy for us understanding operating in Africa. The other benefit we have is that all of our countries we operate in are mining countries. Niger has been producing uranium since 1971. The Nigerians know how to mine uranium. Two mines next door are closing down. I've got over 3,000 labor force standing there waiting to look for jobs. The country exports 60 to 70% of its total exports every year is uranium. They need a new mine to replace the social issues there. We're a $25 cash cost producer all in at 36 we are the potential in this cycle to be the developer. So the next question, well, I'll, I'll give you the sort of basis before I give you the question. I think everybody in the room is in the room because they either experienced the last uranium cycle or they heard about the last uranium cycle. 
the upside in the metal from 10 bucks to 130 bucks, the upside in the stocks. Well, let's look at the most ridiculous paladin from one cent to ten dollars in four and a half years. Uh, pardon the pun, but truly explosive upside. Uh, and everybody, I think, on the panel knows what would happen to their own fortunes if the uranium price went to 60 or 70 dollars. My friend Doug Casey is famous when he talks about optionality using the phrase, when the wind blows, even turkeys can fly. The question becomes the period between now and the storm. How do you keep the turkey from starving to death? If we assume, as an example, that the period between now and the time when the uranium bull market gets uh, going in earnest is, let's say, three years, how much cash do you have? How much cash will you need? And if there is a delta, where do you propose to get it? There is no doubt, to quote Jerry Pogue, another guy I love to quote, if the uranium price goes up, you all are going to be dirty, filthy, stinky, slimy rich. The question is, do you starve before that happens? How much do you have? How much do you need? And where are you going to get the balance? Dan? In 2013, we had 110 people in our company. We currently have under 20. We cut ourselves to the bone. Uh, we have basically mastered the ability of taking the low hanging fruit at low cost all the way through. I've got enough cash in the account to carry me all the way through to June next year. I've got 10 million of warrants that's due to be, that I can accelerate. Um, of an excess of six million of that is actually with two of my strategics who both indicated they're following the money. So I can survive for at least another two years in a tough market as long as we don't have another complete collapse. But it also means that I'm sitting with the cash that if the market does recover this year, I've got instant access to funding to get through into the development stage on this project to accelerate where we go with finalizing the technical, to pull that debt story back in together. And that is very advanced. We're talking to ECAs and banks to advance the conversations that I'm already having with off takers, which we won't close until all the money's in place. So we're well positioned to survive a tough market, but we're also well leveraged ready that if the market turns, we can accelerate with it very quickly. That's a great question. Um, hope isn't a strategy. Hoping this happens, hope that happens, is not a strategy when you got people who work for you and their families count on you. So, and another saying is you take money when you can, not when you have to. We have about $60 million in the bank. Um, and expiration is great that way, you can dial it up and down. We are 20% owned by the central government of China through an SOE called CGN. And the reason we did it was very simple. When you look at the contracts, the way they're uncovered and et cetera, you know in the next 10 years, 800 million pounds are uncovered in contracts. So when we looked at the math, we figured we need to be able to survive at least four years. So we raised 82 million last year on that basis. We said, okay. And then we've also found cheap ways. We've cut our overhead, but the other thing is, because our deposit is very, very close to surface, everything we find is close to surface. So I don't know if you know, but you do RC drilling through overburden, you get to your core and use a core rig. We don't do that anymore. We make sure the RC rig and do a downhill gamut and makes this uranium there, then we keep going. So we found a way to cut our drilling costs by 25 to 30 percent that way. It only works if you have a very close to surface deposit. And so for us, we just plan for the worst. We hope for the best, but you plan for the worst because you owe that to your employees, you owe that to your shareholders. And uh, we're proud to say we have $60 million in the bank. So uh, we just actually closed the financing at 60 cents a premium uh, to the market. Um, no warrant as well, mostly institutional. Uh, Denison uh, was a part of that as well. Uh, sent with just under four million in the treasury. Uh, it's a great question, Rick. I mean, that's uh, you know, <laughs> you got to make sure the turkey's still alive, right? So we. Um, right now, have a budget uh, of drilling for the next, uh, basically the next 18 months. It's $2 million budget, obviously covered for that with the financing uh, that we just closed. Uh, and we're, uh, we're not going to drain the treasury to zero, right? We, we want to have uh, that, that wiggle room uh, in the event uh, there's a sustained weakness in the market. So we're covered for basically the next two years with uh, the, the current treasury. Uh, one of the other things too, the drilling that we're doing, it's focused at one project, the project we feel we have the best shot at adding value on 
making a new or making additional discoveries at the project, continuing to prove up the high grade. Just finished a 5,500 meter drill program. It came in under budget. We had we had accounted for uh, an all-in cost of about $350 a meter. It came in at about $260 all-in a meter. We we're able to do that. There's operational synergies given the proximity of our project to Denison's flagship Wheeler. So a part breaks down on the rig, or you need equipment. It's you're not flying things in from Saskatoon. You're just driving over to Wheeler and, and picking it up there. Also tricks of the trade. Rick and his team have been doing this for a long time. We talk about experience. Little things like putting the, the drill hose uh, into a, a existing previously drilled hole, getting the water from the down from down hole versus the closest lake. It's cold in Saskatchewan. It's minus 20, minus 30 degrees in the winter. That water freezes, your rig shuts down. So getting the water that's deeper down in these previous drill holes, it's eight degrees versus four degrees. It's, it's warmer, it doesn't freeze in the hose when it goes to the drill rig. So little things like that brought our costs down quite a bit. So we'll continue to look at ways. Uh, we run a lean and mean machine as well, corporately. Um, and last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, Prospect Generator. We have five projects. We're bringing partner companies in now. Arriva just uh, optioned one of our projects for $8 million over six years. Another company, Azincourt, we're generating cash flow from those option payments each and every year going forward, as well as share payments as well. So that's another way to essentially subsidize or offset some of the costs, looking at uh, optioning some of our other projects as well. Of the, uh, the companies up here today and maybe a lot of the other uranium companies, ALX probably has the lowest market cap. We're in the six or seven million dollar range. As it, as it turns out, that's about our cash or cash equivalent position. So it's a, it's a pretty good position to be in. Our overhead is low. Uh, I think we have uh, two to three full-time employees. I think our burn rate's less than 50 grand a month. Uh, we use our uh, board members who are all uh, high-level experts in this area. Uh, we use consultants when we need to drill the holes or the geophysical groups that, that do surveys to our specs uh, to, to uh, uh, find the new targets that we want to drill at some point in the future. So yeah, we, we know how to survive in this market. And so you want to know what company may have the best potential for, for doubling from here. I think we're probably uh, that best company. Uh, and, and, you know, Rick knows this, and frankly, I, I know other people on the panel know this, is it's going to take a spark somewhere in the cycle to, to cause a bump. You know, another ranger flood in Australia, another Cigar Lake flood. Uh, there's any number of things that can happen uh, that all of a sudden the market turns overnight. What you want to do is be positioned, and frankly, what Rick said about being in a and a half a dozen or a dozen companies that are still around now when that turn comes, uh, that's probably the most important, most important place to be. Finally, uh, what I've learned in small companies is that we think these are asset intensive businesses, but they're not. They're actually intellectual capital businesses. And the ability of a management team to look at an exploration thesis and ask themselves the most important unanswered question, the thing that adds the most value that generates the most knowledge the quickest for the lowest amount of money. So I want to ask each of you briefly, because we don't have much time left, what's your most important unanswered question? Fully 80% of the juniors where I ask the most important unanswered question respond, hmm, I've never thought of that, which is really useful to me. I can throw the story away and never listen again. Uh, not having a plan is the same as <laughs> planning to fail. So tell me your most important unanswered question how you deliver, how you de-risk your property the fastest, the quickest. And also tell me what the thing that keeps you awake is at night. I learned from my grandfather, if I didn't know three things that could go wrong with an investment, I didn't know enough to make it. So give me the upside, the near-term upside, the unanswered question, and the downside. <laughs> yeah, Rick, that's a tough question. But to me, it all comes down to price and, and what the market's going to do. When will that tick in the market happen? When will that mine that's operating now get confiscated by the government? When does the, you know, the biggest producer in the world is Kazakhstan or Kazakhstan. Uh, maybe they have political issues there and we lose 50 million pounds a year. That's a hell of a turning point and uh, just makes it that more important to be in stable, stable environments. So I don't lose any sleep over the politics in Canada, especially uh, Saskatchewan. 
I, I would lose sleep if I was in Mongolia or, or Kazakhstan or one of these other countries. So I think that's a real important thing uh, uh, to pay attention to is the politics. Uh, is the leader there, as, as uh, George Ericola said back 500 years ago, is the leader there friendly or inimical, having, having the, uh, the, being evil, being against you? Uh, I want to work environments where the government is with us. As far as being able to raise money as we go forward without the uranium price uh, bouncing up to make it easier to raise capital, I think we're, we're pretty much at the low right now, and it's a great time to get in. But again, is it 12 months, 24 months, 36 months before we have a turnaround? You know, I've done this for 40 years, and people have asked me that question all 40 years. I remember 15 years ago, a, a group interviewing me and says, Dave, uranium's at $15 a pound now. What do you think it'll go to? And I said, well, it might double. Well, it went to the 30. And then he asked me again, Dave, it's gone to 30 now. What do you think's gonna happen now? I said, you know, I can see it maybe doubling again. And it went, it went all the way up to $138. Again, if you had the word uranium in your company name, you were a tan banger uh, right, out, right out of the gate. So again, the survivors, you're probably looking at the survivors up here, the ones that are in the market right now. Jordan? All right, make it short and sweet. Uh, the unanswered question, how many economic pounds of uranium do we have at more? So we're drilling to prove that up. As I mentioned earlier, some new extraction technologies that could bring the cost down and ultimately when it goes into production. For us as an exploration company, that'll determine the valuation at the end of the day. Uh, and hopefully if we are acquired uh, at, a, at a higher valuation, uh, we, we look at that. Uh, second unanswered question, discovery potential at other projects we have. We're hoping to again use the prospect generator model, bring in strategic partners to answer those questions for us. Uh, what keeps me up at night, um, you know, I, I think a point to highlight the political, um, in Saskatchewan, the political picture there, was, it's the best jurisdiction in the world. The permitting process is very straightforward. Uh, great, great relations with the First Nations uh, in the province as well. Cameco Arriva, two of the largest employers of, uh, of the First Nations there. So very, very good jurisdiction. What keeps me up at night, um, you know, we, we, it, it, timing, to be honest, right? I mean, we're looking at uh, this, this market. It's volatile right now. We've seen it pull back again. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's been highlighted here. It doesn't take Take much to get this market moving. Couple utilities come back into the market. This herd mentality, like we saw back in the mid 2000s, or a supply disruption. Keep in mind with uranium, there's only a few mines globally that produce a lot of the global supply. If there's any supply disruption, especially like in Kazakhstan, uh, look out. That'll be a big driver. Well, there's no doubt for us. We've tested about we about a hundred odd conductors on our property, and we tested two or three. So we know there's. A couple more out there, we might find something. So that's upside for us. Secondly, the upside would be, um, as David uh, has mentioned, is that you know what caused it last time was uh, a fire and a, and a flood, you know, and um, so the, it's always a black swan event. So something has to happen in Kazakhstan or again in Canada. So those are what industry things for us. We need to keep finding more zones and new areas. What keeps me up is not seeing Japan turn on their reactors. Um, they've only they got 28 more to go. They've turned on four, two more coming. So that's a political issue. And I believe it's caused the Western utilities not to have long-term contracts of five to 10 years. When Japan was in this market, they planned way ahead. But unfortunately, with all the financial issues the Western utilities have, they're not buying three to five years ahead. So. We have to survive the next two to three years if that mental change doesn't happen. But the good news is we've got $60 million in the bank. We have the world's largest utility, CGN, backing us. And they've said, whatever you need, we'll provide. So, uh, Permitting risk is not something I worry about because two of my mines are already permitted. Uh, they were permitted in six months. That's the difference of working in Africa and working in North America. Uh, the governments are pragmatic. They need their mining operations going. Uh, that is a key driver for their business. Um, the things that keep me up at night, including in this, is actually my upsides, which is more what can I do to make my projects even better. We're taking our process route and trying to remove all water from it up to the point we go to the acid tanks. 
why is that important? You spend 80% of your energy is spent pumping water. If I can get rid of the water, I save a lot of money. Uh, we're acquiring additional licenses next to the ones we've got, which we already know the resources are there because we drilled them. Um, had to give them up as part of the permitting process and that's already environmentally covered. So for us, it's all about positioning this thing because we do leave the market. We're going, I don't think you need a black swan event here. I think the market is already starting to tighten up. There is no liquidity. And it certainly worries me on the positive when major utilities are sniffing around the producers, even the small ISRs, trying to find offtake because they're starting to get worried about where it's coming from. We're talking to the tier ones. They're comfy today, as I said. Three years from now, they are very uncomfortable. And five years from now, they are actually scared where they're going to get their material from. So I think you're going to see in a scenario coming up this year where a major utility will come looking for material and he can't find it. And that will move the price. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, three things I think that I want you all to remember. The first thing is that uranium hasn't worked for a few years. And the consequence of that is that people are bored by it. But the other truth is that uranium is one of the most important sources of base load power in the world. The truth is if you make it for 60 and sell it for 22, you have two choices over five or six years. Either the price goes up or the lights go off. You need to decide which one of those there is. Everybody's concerned about timing. They always ask me the when question. As you can tell by looking at me, I've been in this racket a fairly long time. And I've learned that if the answer to the question you're being asked begins with when, not if, it's a very high quality question. My own suspicion is that if you look at the contents of this panel this year, and you look forward three or four years, this panel makes you more money than any other panel at this conference. I'd like you to thank my panelists for making you this money in the future. We look forward to seeing from you. Thanks, Deborah.